Okay. People are starting to creep on in. We are going to dive in. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build Overpowered AI Apps with the OP Stack, OpenAI, and Pinecone. My name is Amanda Wagner. I am the Senior Community Manager here at Pinecone, and we are absolutely thrilled to have you participating in this event. Uh, this event is directly related to what we've seen you building with Pinecone, so we hope you walk away from this uh, with actionable information and feeling inspired. For those of you who don't know who Pinecone is, granted, the assumption is that the majority of you do, uh, Pinecone is a vector database that makes it easy to build high performance vector search applications. Now, before we dive into the content, we do have a few housekeeping rules. Number one, we ask that you use the chat for chat. Uh, we have time at the end of every event for questions and answers. Uh, so to help us out and to make sure we answer all of the questions you have, we ask that you place your questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom. If you miss something, do not worry. This event is being recorded and we will share it with you via email, on our YouTube channel, on social media. You cannot possibly miss it. And if you are not following us on those outlets, I highly recommend you do. If you have questions after the event, something pops up, uh, you can email me personally and I will operate as your inquiry liaison. You can reach me at amanda at pinecone.io and we'll make sure to get those questions answered. You can also reach out if you have an idea for an event or want to collaborate with us on some content. Now, without further ado, I'm going to send it off to James Briggs, our developer advocate at Pinecone, who's going to provide some context around why the OP stack is so powerful. James, take it away. Thanks, Amanda. Um, <clears throat> so as to the OP stack, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty new thing, uh, but I actually want to start by going back before we had all these cool technologies and, and talk about like what I remember as being the, the, the almost like the stages or the typical like day in the life of someone working with NLP. So when I first started, it was all like LSTMs, which are like, you know, for those of you that don't know, they're from a while ago. They're like, uh, they kind of went out of fashion in 2017, 2018. And with these models, what you'd end up doing is training these models for like days in order to do anything. So if you want to do some classification or you want to do a question answering, first you couldn't do it very well. And if you wanted to do it on a particular data set, you would end up training your model for days in order to do that. Um, so you'd need all this data and everything. It would be, you know, it was kind of fun in its own way. Uh, but it was definitely not efficient. And the results were just nothing compared to what you know, we can get now. After that, we ended up with transform models and uh, transfer, what we call transfer learning. So at that point, uh, it, it seemed incredible. What you could do is take a model, a transform model like BERT, that Google had trained on, you know, with literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to train these models. And we could take one of those. And what we could do is just add a couple of layers onto the end of it. And you'd fine tune it for a particular task. It'd probably take an hour or so. Um, you'd need a lot less data and the results would be way, way better. And that was incredible. And then you have like OpenAI uh, that comes along and they have initially GPT-2, now GPT-3, and now even more recently, GPT-3.5 model. I remember the first time I, no, I used it a while ago, but the first time I properly used it, and the first time I used it with Pinecone actually, was back when we were doing an event with OpenAI in like around summer 
2022. And it was just, you know, my mind was completely blown by how in, the performance was just incredible. Like you could ask me these questions and it would answer the questions very accurately. It would source the, the place where it got this information from. And you could also ask it to answer the questions in you know different styles. So you could ask it to answer bullet points. Um, you could do like a conservative Q&A, you know, all, all these really cool things. And that was, you know, like a, a moment where I was you know, incredibly impressed by how far things have gone. And since then, things have just gotten better. So that was a GPT-3 model. Now you have GPT-3.5 models, which are way better. And you also have their embedding models. So opening has embedding models. Uh, they've recent, well, kind of recently released the most recent of those, which is the R002 model. And the, the quality of these models compared to the ones from you know, back in summer, not even that long ago, is just much better and much, much cheaper to use, which, you know, both of those are incredibly useful. So things have gotten a lot better, but even with those releases, we still don't get that much attention in the space. So there was a fair bit, uh, but not that much. And then we had ChatGPT, uh, which kind of like blew the doors <laughs> like right open. Uh, and then everyone is like working on this sort of thing. And it's kind of crazy how much attention this space has got. Like I think the most recent YC batch, um, like 50% or something crazy of those sort of are using large language models or generative AI in some way or another. Um, yeah, I've been speaking to tons of people from all over um, and just everyone is super excited about this. There are people that are coming from like web development. I've never touched machine learning before and they're building these apps uh, that are like incredibly cool. Like you can talk through books or you can uh, search through your favorite podcast you know, do all these really cool things, work incredibly well. And, you know, these people never even touch any of these technologies before. Um, and even more recently, I'm seeing, you know, people from completely different industries coming in. So people that are in finance have, have never really coded that much before, maybe have done a little bit, but not that much. Um, people coming in from healthcare um, and, and just all these different places. I'm super interested in actually building things with this because it's so incredibly easy to use and incredibly powerful. Um, but at the same time, there are issues with these models. Now, we've seen it a lot with the recent chatbot. You know, they kind of come up with um, answers that are not always accurate, right? And, you know, ChatGPT does this quite a lot. And you don't, you don't always get accurate answers, uh, but more importantly, you don't know where the information is coming from. So that's, you know, where Pinecone comes in as a external knowledge base. So you, Put these two things together, you have an external knowledge base with, it could be any information you want in there. And then you just ask these incredibly powerful language models um, to sit there, re refer to that knowledge base and give you answers based on that or, or do a ton of other things. So there is like an incredible number of things you can do with these. And I really think that the, this, level of excitement and the things that you can do with these models is far beyond what I've, it's almost like a, it's an inflection point in NLP, in AI. Um, and it, it's super exciting to actually see what people are building. And with that, actually, I'm going to hand it over to Stephen, um, who is going to, yeah, he, he's got a really cool app, um, I'm sure you a lot of you find it absolutely fascinating. As I said, these apps that are built with OpenAI and Pinecone are incredible. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it over to Stephen. Enjoy. Hello. All right, that's working. Uh, cool. Thanks. Thanks for the intro. So um, I'm uh, I'm filling in short notice uh, to show you a cool little app I made. Um, my day job is not at all in this kind of thing. I make AI for drones and uh, Earth observation and this kind of thing. But I started playing around with uh, GPT-3 a couple of weeks ago or maybe a couple of months ago now um, because a friend of mine makes uh, web services and websites, all kinds of things for um, large enterprise customers. And they were looking at kind of modernizing their 
uh, interaction stack. And so I was looking into how to build sort of some cool things on top of GPT-3. And I quickly ran into the two limitations that James just talked about, uh, one of which is uh, providing uh, accurate information. So knowing where your model is going to be sourcing information from. And um, the second one is actually the size of the data that you can inject. So the, the best way to provide clear, good information to your model is doing something called context injection, which I'm going to show now by sharing my screen, if this all still works. There we go. All right, can you guys see this? Hands up, things like this. Does that work? It looks like it works. Okay, so what you want to do is to uh, inject context into a query. And the way you do that is that you have to retrieve context from somewhere. And you can do that with having uh, local data in your web application, for example. But if you want to have a lot of data, you quickly run into limitations there. So you need something like a vector database like Pinecone to store that information. And so I'm going to show you the little app I made that's online right now. It's called GPT Flix. You can go there, it's gptflix.ai that redirects to the Streamlit app. And what it does is basically it's using GPT-3 on the back end, and GPT-3 is forced to source its knowledge from the vector database that's on Pinecone. So on Pinecone, I have this database, it's called 400K Movies. So what I did is I took a data set from a, a Kaggle uh, research competition that had 400,000 movie reviews. It actually had a few more than that. Um, I appended also some plots, which was another Kaggle data set. So plots of movies like uh, about the story of the movie, about 50,000 of those. And I uploaded all of this to the vector space uh, here on, uh, on Pinecone. So I have a, a database with 452,000 vectors. Each one of these vectors has some metadata, which is actually the text that I want to retrieve uh, when I do a search. So what happens here when you talk to GPT Flix, it's online now, you can go there now, don't all go there at the same time because Streamlit is kind of overloaded right now, but you can ask a question like, uh, what is uh, Men in Black about? And what's going to happen there is that the, uh, this sends a request to Pinecone, uh, check, so this, actually this text is converted to an embedding in the format of the OpenAI language model. That, that embedding is compared to the database on Pinecone. The database retrieves all the relevant data and then OpenAI synthesizes that data uh, into this response. And in the, the API call, I'm forcing the OpenAI API uh, to use a setting of, that's called the temperature set to zero, which means it can't improvise. It has to use the source from the context database that I gave it. Right, so to make that a little clearer, what we're going to do is actually really quickly, and I'm going to show you how easy it is, we're going to build another application. So I'm just going to go through the steps really quickly. Um, if you don't understand everything, that's fine. You can slow it down and watch it later on. But I've created another database here called GPT Wikipedia, which is empty right now. And what I've done is I've downloaded some data, which is, um, this JSON format data, which is a text dump of all of Wikipedia in English. So it's relatively well formatted. It's passable, at least. Um, some of it is, is kind of messy and some of the characters are not correct, but that's okay. Uh, we can take that and we can ingest it uh, in a variety of different ways. So I've wrote some code to ingest it, but you can see this is lots and lots of data. All of these JSON files, each one of these is 40 megabytes and it's all text. So I built a little script that passes these JSON files and makes them into a CSV file. I limited the length of it just because otherwise it'd take forever, this demo. And it gives us this file that's called wiki converted. So this is just a CSV file with text. So it's all kinds of text, all of these Wikipedia entries. And for example, we have, uh, we have a, so actually let's not go to the example yet. So. I have built an application that's going to be using this database. It's called Wikipedia GPT. So Wikipedia GPT .app, uh, that's where it lives. So I can ask it questions, but right now it's just a naive GPT-3. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't have the content of this database yet because the database is empty over here. So if I ask it a question, this is the, the question I ask because I know the content is in the database that I'm going to upload. Who was Pierre de Rosan? Uh, Pierre de Rosan was a French architect and sculptor who was alive in the 17th century. So GPT-3 is making this up. So I'm trying to force it to not make things up, but even so you can't limit it completely. 
So it's that's completely wrong. If you actually look up this guy, Pierre de Rosan, he was a, a Bordeaux wine merchant um, in the 18th century who, who did a bunch of interesting stuff with wine. Uh, but that's not what GPT-3 thinks because it doesn't know. It doesn't have that context. So since we have all of these JSON files and we have all this information, I happen to know that one of them is about this guy. We can convert this. So we make it into uh, a clean uh, a clean little uh, database, clean little CSV file to more for visualization than anything else. And so the CSV file, the first one that I made, actually it's disappeared. It just contains the text content. So it's just this text content. And if we look in here somewhere, there's text about this guy, Pierre de Rosan. So you can see it's down here. So this is the actual Wikipedia article or, or part of the text, at least the top part. And what we can do very easily using the OpenAI stack is that we can send this text in token format to the embeddings model and we get it converted to a vector. So we can find this Rosan guy in this database here. And basically it might be too big. It might take too long to process, but we're going to find that this guy, this article has an associated vector, which is the size of X number of columns, 1,535 columns, which is the, the embedding size for OpenAI. And so since we have this text, we have the associated vector. What we can do now is we can just upload this to, to the Pinecone database. So I've already run this before. So upload to Pango. So what's going to happen here is that we're taking the, the format of this data, we're taking the CSV format, and it's going to start populating this database. So for now, there's zero vectors in here. So this one is the one for GPT Flix. It's full with 450,000 vectors, which actually almost fills up the complete collection on here. Uh, and if we go to GPT Wikipedia, I see it's starting to fill up now. The, the, this script is going through the data and it's, up, it's uploading all this. So you can see it's really, really, really fast. I'm adding a lot of data very, very, very quickly to the database. And all of this data is then going to be indexable and, and queryable using GPT-3. So I've got uh, 8,500 articles, something like this. So if, if I went through my, uh, my file here, uh, the 8,500 first articles in here are already passable, um, already searchable in the database. So this seems to have crashed. I don't know whether our guy is within those articles, but if he is now, if we run, if we run the query against here, this is already searching that database. So it should now return the correct answer. So assuming that that article has actually been up uploaded, it might not have because we might not have got there yet, but we'll see in a second. So what's happening now, I've, I've sent the request. Ah, there we go. There we go. So this is correct. So this data was uploaded that quickly, very, very easily to the database. And now we have the Wikipedia article. So what happened in the background there is actually when I sent that request, um, who was Pierre de Rosan? It was converted to um, embeddings. The embeddings were compared on the Pinecone database to all the data that's already indexed in there. And then if you look here, um, actually the logs are probably not good. These, these are logs from a previous question for some reason. What happens is actually the, the, the content of the database is prepended to the question. I can show you in the code, it will make more sense. But so when I ask a question, um, the question is formatted as your name is WikiGPT, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a tag called content and loaded in content is the context or context rather. Loaded in context is the content that's retrieved from the Pinecone database. So it's limited by token size because there's a limit to how much GPT-3 can ingest, but we're giving GPT-3 the information that's the closest information to the content of your question. And GPT-3 then just needs to summarize that information in a smart way. And as you can see, it, it does it very well. And so this, I mean, this entire app, or at least the, the content that's in the database was literally just uploaded here in real time. And we could let it run forever and populate it with absolutely everything from Wikipedia. And then you'd have a fully 
searchable Wikipedia using Pinecone and OpenAI as a backend. There you go, that's my demo. Uh, back to Amanda. Thank you so much, Stephen. Really helpful. Just as a reminder, we want to get to everybody's questions. So if you have them, please add them to the Q&A portion. Um, and now I'm going to introduce David Greshel. He's a senior marketing manager at HubSpot and creator of Self Service Chat and TextMyWedding.com. David, you're so busy. You're doing a lot. Uh, um, and yeah, David, why don't you show us uh, what you're what you're working on? Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So again, my name's David Greshel. Um, I'm a senior marketing manager at HubSpot, focus on you know the customer experience uh, and chatbots, as well as create some apps on the side. Um, so I'm here to go over how to supercharge your user self-service using OpenAI and Pinecone. Can everyone see my screen? Good. All right, perfect. So what is self-service? So you may be asking yourself that because it's kind of a, a newer term. So self-service is enabling your users to find answers to their questions without reaching out to your support team. So this can be done via chatbot, a UI in your app, email automation, however your customers reach out to you. Um, and you can see here an example from Canva on the left. They have a nice little UI in their app. Let's say you get stuck doing a design. You click the help button. You can find answers to your questions without having to reach out to their support team. Um, as well as they show recommended questions based on where you are in the app and things like that. So now it's time for a demo, enough of the talk. So I'm going to go ahead and put my customer hat on and show you how it works in real life here. So uh, as Amanda said, I've created this app called Text My Wedding. It allows you to send and schedule messages uh, for your wedding, you know, schedule changes, transportation, et cetera. So imagine I'm a user here. I'm like, how do I send a message to my groups? I'm go to guest management. Here's my groups. Not sure how to send a message. Here's a chat. I don't want to wait for an answer. So let's click help. So we ask, how do I send a message? All right. And there's my answer. So sending a one-off message, it gives you the answer. Um, a nice little GIF that shows how to do it. So I'd go over in the app and do it, as well as related questions. So maybe I want to send an individual message. How do I do that? And it shows me how to do that as well as uh, more related questions. And then as another demo, like let's say your, your app's more focused on code. So here's uh, one based on the next JS docs. So like, how do I fetch data on the client side? Gives you an answer here. These are created by GPT-3 and stored in the database, which we'll go over later. Um, and as you can see here, returns the answer explanation with some code on how to do it. Uh, so basically enabling your users to find answers to their questions. So back to the presentation here, you may maybe ask yourself, well, that's all great. How do I do this or how does this work? So the first step is to take your documents. Um, so in my case, like text my wedding or next JS, that would be knowledge-based content and getting the embeddings via open AI. Um, how you do this doesn't matter. You can have a build step that when you change your documents, it gets the embeddings and inserts them in the pine cone. You can create a CSV and do it manually, uh, whatever works easiest for you. So now that we have the embeddings, we need to store them. So you can query them later on. And this is where Pinecone comes in. So you go ahead and store those embeddings in Pinecone uh, in the database. And then now that we're ready to go, uh, you want to help your user self-serve. You would have your UI, chatbot, whatever medium you use. Um, you take the user query. So what they're asking in our case, like how do I send a message? Get the embeddings from OpenAI and then go ahead and query the Pinecone database and return your different documents. So maybe asking, well, what kind of documents can I store? What should I store? Um, and that's the world is your oyster here. It's up to you. So in our demo, I use the knowledge base, uh, protects my wedding, super simple, same with Next.js. You can do videos. So using OpenAI, the Whisper models to transcribe them and store those in uh, Pinecone. You can store frequently asked questions. Um, something that I'm trying now is storing queries. So basically taking what the users asks, uh, storing those in the database, querying against those to get a similar match, and matching it with an ID to a document in another database, um, which I've had good success with. You can put code in there, as well as a, something else I'm trying is product tour. So someone goes, hey, how do I send a message? Uh, we match that in Pinecone, return a specific field in the metadata to say launch product tour, and it'll take you around the app. 
Um, that kind of brings you to my next point. The, my One of my favorite parts of using Pinecone is the metadata fields. You can store a lot of different things in there. Um, so this allows you to like, filter content based on specific user preferences. So let's say your user likes videos and you know that, you're able to go ahead and filter out your content based on that. Um, you know, different locations in your app, you might want different answers, like on a pricing page versus a marketing page, et cetera. So the great thing is it can all be in one database. All right. Now your next question is, all right, this is all great. Uh, I've seen, you know, this open AI and Pinecone everywhere, but I'm not a Python dev. Um, and that was a question I had when I first started, because I know JavaScript, right? And I'm a marketer, but it doesn't matter. Um, you can use any language you like because it's two API calls. So if you're a Go, Rust, Java, Python, JavaScript developer, it doesn't matter. So here are two non-production ready exe code examples here, uh, just to kind of give you a brief overview and idea. So on the left here, we make a call to the open AI embeddings endpoint. Uh, we return the embeddings and then we go ahead and query Pinecone. So with the Pinecone endpoint, you send your embeddings and you get back your, your documents um, to go ahead and return your users in whatever medium that you'd like. All right, so enough of the how, why should I do this? Or why, what's the benefit uh, to me and my users? So I know all of us have sat on a support phone line or on a chat waiting to be connected to someone, waiting to find an answer, et cetera. And we all know how frustrating that is. So helping your user self-serve increases user, user satisfaction. You know, if you're using an app, you find your answer right away and the right answer, uh, you're happy. And this leads to increased CSAT and NPS scores, as well as increased retention. So we know like time to value in an app is super important. If a user comes in and doesn't see value, they bounce and find something else uh, that provides what they're looking for. So finding that time to value is important as well as helping retain them. Um, if they find that value, they're more likely to continue using your product and self-serve and see more value and eventually upgrade or retain and, and stick with your platform. And then I don't know how many of us are solopreneurs here, but I know me, I love to build. I like building features, even if they don't make sense. Um, we all do, but you can spend more time doing that or marketing as we all should, instead of answering repetitive support questions, you know, put those hours back into growing your business and working on it instead of in it. So what can you do beyond this demo? This was a pretty simple demo, like a semantic search, basically. Um, there's so many things you can do. So one of my favorite is clustering and something I use almost every day at HubSpot is basically taking all your user queries and grouping them into similar groups of queries to see what users are asking about most. Um, so you get a good idea of, you know, what do users want? Um, you can even run this through OpenAI to get sentiment on it. So where are the spiciest or hottest friction points that my users are, are running into in the different clusters? You can do anomaly detection. So see outliers in data, recommendations. So as you saw in the demo here, you know, we were able to recommend uh, different questions based on what they're asking. So users can continually self-serve. Um, you can go ahead and do generative q and A. I I would have loved to show a, an example of that, but I hit my hard limit on the open AI credits uh, last night and I haven't been able to get in contact with anyone, but basically feeding all the knowledge from Pinecone as shown earlier into a prompt in GPT-3 and returning a more specific answer than the answers that we pre-generated uh, beforehand. And then classification, just searching for specific labels uh, or text. So thank you. That was my presentation. If you have questions after, you can email me or reach out to me on Twitter um, and I will go ahead and pass it back to Amanda. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys can all come on camera. We have a ton of questions from the audience. We're going to do the best we possibly can to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, and yeah, so David, actually, let's let's start with you. So Chris is wondering, he says, nice UI, David. Uh, what libraries and tools did you use to build the site? So that is all built off of Cloudflare pages, uh, Pinecone, and OpenAI, um, and well, I guess React and Next.js. Cool, thank you. Uh, Steven, going back to you, Seth uh, mentioned that he's building a Q&A that reads a site and answers questions. Some questions are more general, like what is the best thing about your company? whereas some are more specific, like what is your address? I've had better luck with the specific questions. What are strategies for synthesizing more general answers? 
Well, that's um, that's a limitation of how the the context injection system really works with these models because um, because you're looking at uh, and when you input a query, your query is converted to embeddings, and so the content of the query matters a lot as to what will be the closest um, in the vector space on the Pinecone database. So if you can get your users to include in their question the subject matter that they want a response to it'll work a lot better like if you if you go on the a gpt flicks if you include the title of a movie it works really well if you ask like what was that will smith movie where he was fighting aliens in a black suit like that probably won't work unless the the content of your database where you have the possible responses contains a lot of those keywords so in the end, you're looking in word space, so to speak. So if you have people asking very, very general questions, one technique that can work and something I've been playing with, but I, I don't have in this demo here, is to actually have um, metadata that you add yourself to each of your text contents. So for example, if you have people asking questions about your business, and some of those questions are, for example, related to a specific type of technology, all of the branches, all of the contents related to that technology in your database, even if those pieces of text don't contain the name of the tech, you could add it uh, before you input this, this data in the database and before you calculate the embeddings. That way you'll have that proximity added somewhat artificially, but it'll be in the data. And then also on Panko, on the API, uh, I, I'm not an expert, but uh, from what I've seen, you can retrieve the top 100 uh, closest um, pieces of data. So that also gives you actually quite a lot of scope. So the way I'm doing it in this demo is very naive. I'm taking just the top pieces of data until I run out of context space. Uh, but you could be a lot smarter about that. You could actually pass the top 100 pieces of data and you could build a prompt that the user doesn't have to see on the back end that's really looking through all of that data and finding the most relevant answer. So there are many, many, many ways to build that out, but you're kind of getting into the complexity of how language works beyond the, the, the proximity in the database at that point. So the answer is you can do it. It's just, there are many ways to do it. Okay, thank you, super helpful. Um, James, this one I'm gonna point in your direction, but if you guys have some input here, feel free to just chime on in. Uh, Zahid says, I'm pretty new to vector databases. What kind of metadata is appropriate to be storing in Pinecone versus storing data elsewhere? SQL and storing an ID in Pinecone. Okay, I'll mute myself. Um, so <laughs> has to happen once kind of every call. It has to. Yeah, of course. Um, so this kind of depends on your use case and, and, and what you want to store in Pinecone. Um, there are some limits. So if your metadata is like a string, insert, float, you can store it. Um, if your total metadata per vector is more than 10 kilobytes, then um, that's too much. So you need to trim it down. So as long as you don't go beyond those factors, you're okay and you can store it in Pinecone. Uh, what we tend to see uh, in most cases that people either just put everything in there because it's easier or what people do if they need to be a bit more selective about it is they will store like say you have text data like a big chunk of text um you can't really do much with that when it's in pineco and it's just kind of being stored there so what people tend to do is store that externally and then if you have a thing like metadata like dates or like document categories or something along those lines then you can store that in Pinecone. And what you can do with that is um, something called metadata filtering, where you can, like say you only want to search for documents that are from the HR department, for example, um, you would be able to do that. You just add HR to your filter uh, and it will do that. Or if you just want to search for uh, recent documents, you can do that. You just kind of say like anything that's greater than this particular time sum. So yeah, it, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, you can store a lot of stuff in there, um, but realistically, most of what you were storing there, you probably want to use for like metadata filtering or something along those lines, depending on what you're doing. 
Cool. Thank you. And this is this is kind of for anybody. Any tips on chunking data before inserting into Pinecone's database? Have you seen any approaches that work better than others? Uh, yeah. I, I, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, James, you go. Okay, I'll go a really quick one. My, my go to uh, with this is to chunk. It depends on how much like data, what model you're using for starters, um, but also how much data you want, like you, you need in order for the text to be meaningful. Uh, so basically, you want it to be the chunk size needs to be large enough that like whatever you're capturing there is meaningful. Um, but you don't want to necessarily go too large because when you're putting that into your generation model or whatever, it's going to cost you more in order to process all of that. Um, but that being said, there are benefits to increasing that. Um, the one thing that I would add to that is that it's usually a good idea to add some overlap between your chunks. So let's say you, you chunk, let's say five paragraphs at once, uh, just include like one or two sentences overlap between the chunks so that you're not missing any like uh, potentially connecting information there that you you might otherwise like cut in the middle of. Um, but beyond that, oh, and also try and chunk on like new line characters or spaces if you really have to. Um, but beyond that, I think that's kind of like the rule of thumb. Otherwise, it depends on your your data. Yeah, Steve, that's feel, why I was going to say, to say, yeah, I was going to say exactly the same thing. So keep some overlap so you're not losing uh, context. And um, the other thing is the, the database itself on Pinecone, I mean, for, compared to what you would want for most consumer applications, like answering questions about a, a store or something like this, you have loads and loads of space. So from my own tests, it, it often makes sense to, to make smaller chunks with more overlap. And when you retrieve the closest content, just keep a wider window so you're taking uh, let's say 20 pieces of context instead of taking the top two um, because then you'll you'll get I mean you can get all of the information that way um, and you won't fill up the database very quickly unless you upload all of Wikipedia which then you will fill up the database I can tell you that <laughs> Stephen this one's for you are there any other metrics which you can use for similarity other than cosine similarity for word embeddings I haven't explored that at the moment. I mean, on, on Pinecone, I see there's three different ways you can calculate proximity for the vectors. I don't think there's anything that would make sense really with the the way the embeddings are built uh, from OpenAI in this context. So I, I don't know, but uh, I doubt it would be really useful to do it in another way right now. Cool. And, and then Jacob Lee has a question. I'm not 100% on who this is geared towards. Also, for those of you participating, feel free to add your own answers to these questions in the chat. Uh, Jacob Lee says, really amazing demo. Was wondering if there is a GUI way of viewing or editing what is being stored in the vector database. Attaching a second question to that, was curious if there's a way to search through all namespaces within an index. Uh, the, there's no way to search through all namespaces in an index. When you, when you search, you, you are searching specifically through uh, a single namespace. Uh, what, you know, if, if you are wanting to do that, you, a good way to do so is to use metadata filtering. And basically when you are doing those searches where you want to uh, essentially going to one namespace, you just filter uh, for a particular item, but then obviously you store everything in a single um, namespace. And then for the other question, um, what was the other question again, Amanda? Uh, was curious if there is a way to search through all namespaces within index. No, no, the, the one before. <laughs> before oh, just that. kidding, just kidding. Uh, was wondering if there is a GUI way of viewing or editing what is being stored in the vector database. Yeah, I mean, you can you can go through. It's limited, but you have the Pinecone console, um, so you can kind of view everything in there and um, do a little bit in there. But you 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 would need to use the client um, or or the REST API or something in order to do like everything. 
Okay. Sticking on the whole uh, metadata link, William Moore wants to know, uh, would like to know more about the use of metadata. The idea would be to have a context for a user input. For my use case, I would like to answer a question differently if the user is a current client or not. Is this where metadata is used and how? Uh, so I, I would say no. Uh, metadata would be more like specific to your data uh, rather than specific to whoever is answering or asking the question. Uh, in that case, if it's someone who is, you, know, you want to answer the question in a slightly different way, um, you would modify the prompt that you're feeding into the large language model. Or I just thought um, maybe this is more aligned to what you were thinking. Um, if you are wanting to search a different data set based on whether this is a um, like a logged in user or not. In that case, then yes, you would use metadata filtering. So you would um, you, you would have like a, a client field or, or something like that in Pinecone uh, that says yes or no. And if they're logged in, it's yes. And it would just filter for those um, items in your in your VEX database. Either of you want to add additional color? No, I mean, you could just have a separate namespace for logged in and users, but uh, yeah, I mean, you could you can filter it if you want to. And it's, there's many ways you could solve that problem, really. Aaron Dunn wants to know, what guidance can you provide on spitting up the text before creating the embeddings? How many words per embedding vector? It is generally preferable to uh, maximum the size of the input text that goes into each vector or minimize it. I'm a little confused by that question. I, I'm, I, I guess the question is, do you want to vectorize, do you want to use the maximum possible size yeah. of context before you vectorize the content? Um, the reality is that the maximum context, it depends on the model you're using. Obviously, you can use this with all of the GPT-3 backend. I mean, with many other things, but that's what we're talking about here. Um, the, uh, most people are building on DaVinci 003 right now, which is the biggest model. And it has a context length of 4,190 tokens or something like this, which is a lot of words, right? I mean, um, that, that's a couple of pages of text. And the reality is that generally, if you're just trying to retrieve one salient point of information about something precise, that's far too much context. So in reality, when you're building an app for this, um, it would be quite rare that you would fill that before converting something to embeddings. Like you'll want to chunk that down into smaller pieces in reality. So you, you don't really encounter that question. So this will be our second to last question. I know there's so many questions out there, but I'll make sure to get it to our speakers and follow up with y'all. Uh, but how much time does it take to retrieve the answer from the vector DB? I imagine it's based on the number of vectors. I have some documents I want to embed and upload to Pinecone. What approach would you recommend? I think you guys are the, the experts, James, yeah, James, maybe. This no, is all but... you. This is all you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Can you just repeat? I was uh, reading the comments. I know. There's so much. You guys are very active today. <laughs> we appreciate it. Uh, how much time does it take to retrieve the answer from the vector database? I imagine it's based on the number of vectors. I have some documents I want to embed and upload to Pinecone. What approach would you recommend? Right. Um, so... So it's, it's very fast. Um, it depends. Basically, most of the wait time is going to network latency. So it depends on where you are located. Um, so if you're using like Google Colab in a similar region to where your Pinecone instance is, you're going to be waiting like um, like thirty milliseconds, um, at, like around that. Um, and as you just like a typical number that will increase over time as you uh, add more vectors, but then it decreases once you add more parts. Um, 
So it, it kind of, it, it will go up slightly over time as you add like literally tens of millions of vectors. Uh, but even if you have like a billion vectors, it's still going to be uh, pretty quick. So not too much of an issue. Yeah, yeah. For, for practical purposes, the GPT Flix app has 450,000 vectors. And I mean, the, the actual time to retrieve the, the top K most uh, closest vectors is instant. I mean, it's just the query to the to the REST API that takes some time. Like, I, I can't measure that. I've tried to see if it takes any time, and it seems the response is instant for, for my purposes. Cool. And so we'll close on this question. This is this is from me. Uh, you know, you guys, Stephen and David, have maybe unconventional backgrounds. And so when it comes to somebody who's trying to build with the OP stack, you know, are there any resources or uh, things that you consistently turn to for aid in, in your building process? David, how I see you nodding your head. Yeah, I think, so how I found Pinecone and, and things like that was actually through James's YouTube. Um, there's a lot of good, awesome tutorials on there. And a lot of it too, is just not being afraid to go out and test it and try it and learning from it. Cause a lot, it's not, not everything so straightforward with AI, you get some interesting results and weird things. You just have to try a bunch of different things. Um, and then Twitter as well. There's a lot of good, good content and people testing things on there. We can get ideas. Yeah, exactly. Same thing. Just try things that there's lots of resources on Twitter. Um, another thing is uh, you can look up Langchain. There's a whole community around Langchain. that have done some cool stuff. Um, GPT Index did some cool stuff. So both of those, you can look them up on GitHub. And um, the OpenAI cookbook is really good. It's the most popular repo on GitHub has been for the last few weeks. They have some really great resources in there. Some things don't work, um, but they're fixing it really quickly. So they're doing a pretty good job. Um, I'm also going to open source this little app uh, with Streamlit um, as soon as I have the time to clean up the code and, and get rid of my API keys and stuff in there. So hopefully tomorrow I'll open source that as well if you want to dig around and see how that works. So there you go. Very cool. James, I think it's fun that you were uh, quoted as one of the resources. What is the resources resources? <laughs> what are mine? Um... I don't know the, the internet. Just tell them you um, look everything up on chat GPT. Just, just ask <laughs> actually, no, uh, please don't. Please don't tell them that. Funny thing about that. <laughs> <laughs> chat GPT is useful. I, I will say that. It is. Yeah. I've used it to pass some obnoxious JSON files and things like that. It's been quite handy. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you all for participating. I know there's a lot of questions out there. We will follow up um, and share this with everyone. This video will be available again this week uh, on our YouTube. We'll share via our social media. And we're really happy that you guys were all able to join us. And now one thing I always miss from in-person events, I think we deserve to give ourselves a round of applause. So thank you, everyone. Hope you join us again. Have a good one. Thanks, so. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.